Hello and welcome to the channel Science Match Engineering. Today we are going to solve the GATE 2011 Mechanical Engineering Paper Part 3. So let's get started. So we have already done from question 1 to question 40 in our part 1 and part 2. So let's get started for part 3. An ideal Breton cycle operating between the pressure limits of 1 bar and 6 bar has minimum and maximum temperatures of 300 Kelvin and 1500 Kelvin. The ratios of specific heats of the working fluid is 1.4. The approximate final temperatures in Kelvin at the end of the compression and expansion processes are respectively. So we need to find out the final temperatures at the end of compression that okay at the end of compression means after coming out from the compressor and that is T2 and the and after the end of expansion process that is T4. So the answer is A. So how we find out A that is 500 Kelvin and 900 Kelvin. So we have Cp by Cb that is gamma is equal to 1.4. Therefore the compression expansion processes are isentropic as gamma is equal to 1.4. Okay. Now we have this figure Ts diagram uh, of the Breton cycle. Okay, 1, 2 is the compression isentropic and 3, 4 is the uh, expansion. So isentropic 2, 3 and 1, 4 are isobaric processes. Now, it, uh, T1 we know, T3 we know, P1 we know, P2 we know. We have this formula T2 by T1 which is also equal to T3 by T4 which is equal to P2 by P1 to the power gamma minus 1 by gamma. So, we have, we already have P2 by P1 is 6 by 1. So, 6 by 1 to the power 1.4 minus 1 divided by 1.4 which is equal to 1.6685. So, our T2 is what? T1 into 1.6685 then which is approximately equal to 500 Kelvin and T3 by T4 is 1.6685. So, T4 would be how much? 1500 divided by 1.6685 which is equal to 899.01 Kelvin or approximately equal to 900 Kelvin. So answer is 500 Kelvin and 900 Kelvin. So we'll go to the next question. A disc of mass M is attached to a spring of stiffness K as shown in the figure. The disc rolls without slipping on a horizontal surface. The natural frequency of vibration of the system is, so here we have a disc that is rolling without slipping on a horizontal surface and then we have a spring so we need to find out the natural frequency of the vibration okay so the answer is it is p that is 1 by 2 pi root over 2k by 3m so let's see how we get it so we know that the total energy of the system is equal to the kinetic energy due to translation translation and then plus kinetic energy due to rotation plus potential energy of the spring. So, E is equal to half of mv square mass of the disk into the linear velocity half of mv square plus half of i omega square where i is the moment of inertia and omega is the angular rotation in RPM. Okay. So, i omega square plus half of kx square, kx square is the potential energy of the spring. So from here, we get E is equal to half of m into, we can write V is equal to r omega. So half of m into r omega whole square plus half of, we can write uh, the moment of inertia of a disk is mr square by 2. Okay. So uh, from here we get, uh, half of i is half of mr square by 2. So, half of mr square by 2 into half into omega square. So, we get, we come to this, this second line, E is equal to then half of m r omega whole square that is of instead of v, instead of i we have mr square by 2. So, plus half of mr square by 2 into omega square plus half of k into what we can write, x would be equal to 
this x no distance along this direction x would be equal to r into theta the angular rotation that we have so r theta whole square so from which where e is equal to then 3 by 4 m r square omega square plus half of k r square theta square right now omega is what omega we can write as theta dot okay so 3 by 4 m r square theta dot whole square plus half of k r square theta square now as e is constant so d e by d theta would be equal to 0 that is the total energy of the system is conserved okay so from here we get 3 by 4 into m r square into 2 theta dot into theta double dot plus half of k r square into 2 theta into theta dot equal to 0 so if we simplify we get 3 by 2 m into theta double dot plus k theta is equal to 0 now this is of the form mx double dot plus kx equal to 0 so omega n is equal to root over k by m then so here then omega n would be what root over k by 3 by 2 m so it is root over 2 k by 3 m in radian per second now when we need the frequency in hertz it would be what it would be omega n divided by 2 pi so fn is equal to 1 by 2 pi 1 by 2 pi uh, root over k by 3 by 2 m or 1 by 2 pi root 2 k by 3 m hertz so we have our option c is the correct answer so we'll go to the next question a 1 kg block is resting on a surface with coefficient of friction mu is equal to 0 0.1 a force of 0 0.8 Newton is applied to the block as shown in the figure. The frictional force is, so we need to find out the frictional force. So let us check the answer. See, we have 1 kg weight. So the weight of the block in Newton would be 9.8 Newton. Now, as there is no other forces in the vertical direction, so the reaction force would be again equal to 9.8 Newton. Now maximum frictional force that is that is the limiting force of friction would be equal to F is equal to mu R. That is F equal to 0 0.1 into 9.8 that is 9.98 Newton. Now as you can see only a force of 0.8 Newton is applied on the body. So as this force is less than the limiting force of friction, so our body our frictional force would be only equal to this force. So, it would be equal to 0 0.8 Newton. Now, in case, had it not been the case, then F would have been 0.98 Newton. 0.8 Newton is the force that we are applying. Then the body should have moved in the other direction. But we know that the body won't move because the, till the force we are applying, if the force is still the limiting force of friction, the frictional force is equal to the force that we are applying. Once we cross that limiting force of friction and once the body start moving, then our this force, this force would be greater than this force. So, the frictional force would be the limiting force of friction, then that would be 0 0.98 Newton. Okay. So, we will go to the next question. Consider the following system of equations 2x1 plus x2 plus x3 equal to 0, x2 minus x3 equal to 0 and x1 plus x2 equal to 0. Now this system has whether a unique solution, no solution, infinite number of solutions or 5 solutions. So let us check the answer. So this, we, if we, when we need, when we have this kind of equations, well, what we do, we first make it in the form of a matrix okay so we have 2 1 1 and 2 1 1 and that uh, solution uh, then on the right hand side is 0 then 0 x1 and then 1 and minus 1 x2 and then 0 then 1 1 0 and this side right hand side is 0 so if our system of equation is a1 x plus b1 y plus c1 z equal to d1 as in, uh, then a2x plus b2y plus c2z equal to d2 and a3x plus b3y plus c3z equal to d3 then from here we get that our d1 
equal to d2 equal to d3 equal to 0 if we compare these two set of equations. Now, we need to find out the x determinant that is delta 1 which is equal to d1, d2, d3, b1, b2, b3, c1, c2, c3 that this matrix determinant. Now, this is equal to 0 as d1, d2 and d3 are 0. Similarly, the, our uh, determinant 2 is again 0 as d1, d2, d3 is 0, determinant 3 is also 0. So, we find that determinant 1, determinant 2, determinant 3 are all 0. Now, we try to find out the main determinant that is delta. So, delta is what? Delta is the determinant of this uh, matrix of the solution. So, if when we find that, that determinant, we get 2 into 0 plus 1 minus 1 into 0 plus 1 plus 1 into 0 minus 1. So, we get 2 into 1 that is 2 minus 1 and minus 1. So, it is 0. So, now delta 1, delta 2, delta 3 equals 0 and mean delta determinant is also 0. Therefore, this kind of system of equations have infinite number of solutions. Okay. And if this mean determinant is 0 and at least one of determinant delta 1, delta 2, delta 3 is non-zero, then the system would have had no solution. And if the this determinant is not equal to 0, then the system would have an unique solution which would be given by x is equal to delta 1 divided by delta, y equal delta 2 divided by delta and z equal delta 3 divided by delta. Okay. So, we will go to the next question. A single point cutting tool with 12 degree rake angle is used to machine a steel workpiece. The depth of cut that is uncut thickness is 0 0.81 mm. The chip thickness under orthogonal machining condition is 1.8 mm. The shear angle is approximately, so we need to find out the shear angle. So, the solution is the shear angle is approximately 26 degrees. So, let us see how we find out. We have rake angle alpha is equal to 12 degree. Uncut thickness that is T1 is equal to 0 0.81 mm. Chip thickness under orthogonal machining condition T2 is equal to 1.8 mm. Now, chip thickness ratio is R is equal to T1 by T2, which here would be 0 0.45, that is 0 0.81 divided by 1.8. Now, we know that 10 pi is equal to r cos alpha divided by 1 minus r sin alpha. So, which is equal to 0.45 into cos of 12 divided by 1 minus 0.45 into sin of 12 degrees, which is equal to 0 0.4856. So, once we get the 10 inverse, we get pi is equal to 25.9 degree, that is approximately equal to 26 degree. So, the shear angle is approximately 26 degree. So, we go to the next question. So, here we need to match the following non-traditional machining processes with the corresponding material removal mechanism. So, we have chemical machining, we have electrochemical machining, we have electro discharge machining and we have ultrasonic machining. Here the mechanisms are erosion, corrosive reaction, ion displacement and fusion and vaporization. So, let us match them. So, you see. Chemical machining uses a very strong corrosive chemical for material removal. Okay. So, chemical machining is connected to corrosive reaction. Next, we have electrochemical machining. It is used for materials having low machinability or for complicated shapes. Okay. So, we say it as ECM. So, it is having low machining, it is for low machinability materials or complicated shape. It uses the reverse of electroplating. Electroplating as we know where we deposit a certain material. In this one we remove the certain material. Okay, And the machining is done by the involvement of ions. So like electroplating here also it is by the movement of ions. So electrochemical machining would be ion displacement. So Q is 3. Next in electro 
electrode discharge machining ETM, there are sparks that are produced between two points of the anode and cathode and very intense heat is generated in a very small region. Okay, and here the material melts and evaporates in this small zone. So, in electro discharge machining, we have fusion and vaporization, which is R is 4. And in, elect in ultrasonic machining, it uses a slurry of abrasive. This slurry of abrasive impacts the hard and brittle work surface and we also have a pressure applied uh, applied from top so this uh, ultrasonic machining this uh, which have this abrasives so they go and impact this work surface and it wears out ultrasonic machining is generally used for very hard materials which are generally which are generally brittle as we know hard materials are generally brittle so this is done by erosion so ultrasonic machining the me mechanism of material removal is erosion so our option a is the correct option so go to the next question a cubic casting of 50 mm site undergoes a volumetric solidification shrinkage and volu volumetric solid contraction of 4 percent and 6 percent respectively no riser is used Assume uniform cooling in all directions. The side of the cube after solidification and contraction is. So, we are basically given that initial size is 50 mm. And we have two kind of shrinkages. Uh, One is volumetric solidification shrinkage and we have volumetric solid contraction. So, their percentage is given. So, we need to find out the new side of the cube. So, the answer is. You see, initially the volume is 50 cube mm cube. So, 50 cube millimeter cube or cubic millimeter. So, the volume of the cube after volumetric shrinkage would be 0.96 times of this volume. And after that, if we uh, take into account the volumetric solid contraction, then the volume becomes 0.94 into this 0.96 into 50 cube. So, now this volume is actually a cube so mm, the side of the so the volume of this cube is a cube so a would be equal to cube root of this value that is cube root of 0.94 into 0.96 into 50 cube which is equal to 48.317 millimeter or approximately equal to 48.32 millimeter okay so we'll go to the next question okay so these uh, here we have two questions it is a common data question and it is it says that in an experimental setup air flows between two stations p and q adiabatically the direction of flow depends on the pressure and temperature main conditions maintained at p and q the conditions at station p are 150 kilopascal and 350 kelvin the temperature at station q is 300 kelvin the following are the properties and relations pertaining to air. We have specific heat and constant pressure, Cp is 1.005. We have Cv is equal to 0 0.718, both in kilojoule per kg Kelvin. Then we have characteristic gas constant, Ir is equal to 0.287 kilojoule per kg Kelvin or 287 joule per kg Kelvin. Then we have enthalpy, H equal to Cpt and internal energy, U is equal to Cvt. So, uh, the question here is that if the air has to flow from station P to station Q, the maximum possible value of pressure in kilopascal at station Q is close to. So, we need to find out the maximum possible value of the pressure. Okay. Again, next question is that if the pressure at Q, now the pressure at Q is given. So, we need to find out the change in entropy SQ minus SP in kilojoule per kg Kelvin. So the answers are here we see that the air flows from P to Q adiabatically. Now, if we need to find out the maximum value of pressure at Q, so we need to find out the pressure when the air flows in a air flow is reversible as well as adiabatic. That is, it is isentropic. Now, if it is isentropic, then PQ by 
pp is equal to tq by tp to the power gamma by gamma minus 1. Okay. Had it been p means you we know now nah, that p2 by p1 is equal to t2 by t1 to the power gamma by gamma minus 1. And if we reverse it, then t2 by t1 is equal to p2 by p1 to the power gamma minus 1 by gamma. So here, as we need pressure, so we are using this formula. So pq is equal to pp into tq by tp to the power gamma minus 1 by gamma. Now pp is 150 kilopascal. We already know that. Then the temperature at q is 300 Kelvin. Temperature p is 350 Kelvin. Gamma we already know as 1.4. So our value is 87.45 kilopascal or 87 kilopascal. Okay. Now next question here we were say that the entropy that the pressure is already given as 50 kilopascal we need to find the change in entropy now the p pressure is already uh, 150 kilopascal that has not changed q pressure is 50 kilopascal temperature at p is 350 kelvin and temperature at q is uh, again the same 300 kelvin now so sq minus sp that is Entropy at Q minus entropy at P is equal to Cp into log of Tq by Tp minus R into log of Pq by Tp. So from here we get the change in entropy is equal to 0 0.160 kilojoule per kg Kelvin. Okay. So we'll go to the next question. One unit of product P1 requires 3 kg of resource R1 and 1 kg of resource R2. So P1 requires 3 kg of R1 and 1 kg of R2. Now 1 unit of P2 requires 2 kg of resource R1 and 2 kg of resource R2. The profits per unit by selling product P1 and P2 are rupees 2000 and rupees 3000 respectively. Now the manufacturer has 90 kg of resource R1 and 100 kg of resource R2. So the questions are the unit worth of resource R2 that is its dual price of resource R2 in rupees per kg is. So if R2 is if R2 is scarce then it will have a dual price. So we need to find out that dual price. However, if R2 is in excess, it is in slack, then the dual price would be 0. And we also need to find out the manufact the maximum profit that the manufacturer can make. Okay. So this is a linear programming problem. Okay. This is from operation research. So the answers are here we will find out the we will first set up the problem you see we get 2000 rupees 2000 rupees by selling p1 and 3000 rupees by selling p2 so number of p1 if it is uh, uh, the number of p1 if we put here number p1 that we are producing number of p2 if we are producing that we put here then we get a maximum profit again For resource 1, we, what we have is that for every every P1, we need 3 units of resource 1 and two. Uh, for every P2, we need 2 units of resource 1. So, 3 of P1 plus 2 of P2 should be less than or equal to 90 as we have only 90 units of resource 1. Similarly, we need 1 unit of resource 2 for p1 and 2 unit of resource 2 for p2 and we have total resource for of r of r2 is 100 so p1 plus 2 p2 should be less than equal to 100 again p1 should be greater than or equal to 0 and p2 should be greater than or equal to 0 as we are manufacturing something it cannot be negative now we are introducing non-negative slack variables that is S1 and S2 to convert this inequality into equality. 
we have maximize z is equal to 2000 p1 plus 3000 p2 plus 0 into s1 plus 0 into s2 as we get no price for any of the resources r1 or r2 even if we have it in excess okay now 3p1 plus 2p2 plus s1 equal to 90 so if resource 1 some um, quantity is left that that quantity would be s1 so with this we come to the equality similarly for resource 2 we have s2 so any if anything is left of resource 2 that would be s2 so now let us take up the initial basic feasible solution as p1 is equal to p2 is equal to 0 so we are producing no goods at that time slack would be 90 slack 1 and slack that means s1 would be 90 and s2 would be 100 so uh, both our resources r1 r2 are in full capacity and our jet is 0 so with this we will start the lpp so our basic variable is s1 and s2 and these are all 0 and 0 from the, our equation we have 3 units of 3 units 2 units slack is 1 and 0 so it is 90 and then 1 2 0 and 1 so we have 100 so what we need to do is that here we will write the value for the maximization problem so 2000 3000 0 and 0 now we need to we need to find zz for that we need to multiply this into this plus this into this so what do you get what is the value here 0 so 0 into 3 0 plus 0 into 1 0 0 into 2 0 plus 0 into 2 0 0 into 1 0 plus 0 into 1 0 0 into 0 0 z plus 0 into 1 0 so we have all 0 now we need to find out cj minus zj so this is the cj value so 2000 minus 0 is 2000 3000 minus 0 is 3000 okay so here the maximum value is 3000 so it becomes the key column so key column is this one now once we have found the key column we need to divide the solution by the key column element so 90 divided by 2 is 45 100 divided by 2 is 50 once we get this value this is called the minimum ratio here we need to find out which is the smallest smallest so that is 45 here right so this would become the key row so 3 2 1 0 and this 90 becomes the key row and this 2 which is in key row and key column becomes the key element okay now if this cj minus zj if everything is less than or equal to 0 then we reach the optimum otherwise we have not reached the optimum so this was the basic feasible solution so we'll go to the first iteration before we go to the first iteration here s1 is the key row right s1 is in the key row and p2 is in the key column so s1 would be the leaving variable and p2 would be the entering variable okay so in the first iteration p2 would be here and s1 will go up so we will have only p2 and s2 and the value of p2 that is 3000 would be in this cp okay we'll go to the next the first iteration so in this first iteration we now have p2 the value 3000 s2 already there now all the elements of p2 we are dividing by the key element so what we have is that 3 becomes 3 by 2 2 becomes 1 1 becomes 1 by 2 0 becomes 0 only and 90 becomes 45 so 3 becomes 3 by 2 2 becomes 1 1 becomes 1 by 2 and 0 remains 0 and 90 becomes 45 okay now to get to the second row we have this equation which says old value minus the corresponding key column so corresponding key column into the 
corresponding key row divided by the key element. So, it would be 1 minus 2 into 3 divided by 2. So, which is equal to minus 2. So, here we have minus 2. So, next one it is 2 into 2 uh, sorry I am uh, I, I will repeat it 2 minus 2 into 2 divided by 2 so what we have 2 minus 2 which is equal to 0 then next we have 0 minus 2 into 1 divided by 2 which is equal to minus 1. So, we have minus 1. Then, we have 1 minus 2 into 0 divided by 2. So, we have 1. 1, right? This one. Then, the last one, we have 100 minus 2 into 90 divided by 2. So, we have 100 minus 90 that is 10. So, we get this value as 10. Okay. Now, we will find the ZZ which is equal to 3000 into 3 by 2 which is 4500. 3000 into 1 that is 3000. 3000 into 1 by 2 that is 1500. And 3000 into 0 that is 0. It's because this part is 0 so I am not adding that part. Uh, so that part addition is already taken care of and 3000 into 45 that is equal to 1,35,000. So CJ minus ZJ would be how much? 2000 minus 4500 is minus 2500, 3000 minus 3000 is 0, 0 minus 1500 is minus 1500 and 0 minus 0 is 0. Now we see that CJ minus ZJ is less than or equal to 0. So, we have reached the optimum. So, optimum is reached. So, what it says then? The number of items of P2 that is to be made is 45. Okay. And the maximum profit is 1,35,000. Okay. So, our, okay, 1,35,000. So, that we keep in mind. Now, see, this slack S2 is now 10. Okay. So, it is slack for R2 is positive. That means one unit worth of the residual R2 that is its dual price is now 0. Why? You see, we already have this uh, R2 resource in abundance. So, any extra we do not require. So, it any extra if we had required then we have paid more now as we do not need to pay more so it is zero okay so our answers are the unit uh, worth of resource r2 uh, that is this dual price is zero and the manufacturer can make a maximum profit of one lakh thirty five thousand okay so we'll go to the next question a triangular shaped cantilever beam of uniform thickness is shown in the figure. The Young's modulus of the material of the beam is E. A concentrated load P is applied at the free end of the beam. So, this P is the applied. Okay. So, this is the figure. So, this, this is the top view. This is the front view. So, we need to find out the area moment of inertia about the neutral axis of a cross section at the distance x from the free end. So, x is from the, from this free end, this x. Okay. And what is the value we need to find out? And we need to find out the maximum deflection of the beam. Okay. So, let us solve it. Now, width of a cross section at a distance x measured from the free end, if it is Bw, it would be equal to B into x by L. If this width is B, this 
is L. So, this width B W would be equal to B into X divided by L. Okay, you can check it out from your similarity of triangle. Now, area moment of inertia about the neutral axis of a cross section at a distance x measured from the free end would be i is equal to half of b w into t cube. So, what we have i is equal to half of b into x by l into t cube. So, it is b x t cube by 12 l. Okay. Now, for the maximum deflection, we can use the Castiglianos theorem which says that the delta i is equal to delta w by delta w delta u by delta w i where u is the total strain energy of the structure and w i is the weight at the location i and delta i is what the deflection at the location i okay and we also know that u is equal to integration 0 to l m square dx divided by 2 e i where e is the Young's modulus and i is the moment of inertia now here as you can see that p is at a distance x from where we are considering so moment is p into x now u is equal to integration 0 to l m square dx by 2 ei as m is px so m is px and i is bx t cube by 12 l so u is equal to integration 0 to l p square x square dx divided by 2e into bx t cube divided by 12 l. So, once we integrate, we get this is a 6 p square lx by eb t cube dx which is equal to 3 p square l cube divided by eb t cube. Now, we know that therefore that for a cantilever beam maximum deflection occurs at the free end therefore the max deflection at the free end would be del u divided by del b okay del p y because we need have the del w i is the weight the weight is here at p so del u by del p which is equal to then 6 p l cube divided by e b t cube so answer is d the maximum reflection is 6 p l cube divided by e b t cube. So, we will go to the next question. The temperature and pressure of air in a large reservoir are 400 Kelvin and 3 bar respectively. A converging diverging nozzle of exit area 0 0.005 meter square is fitted to the wall of the reservoir as shown in the figure. Okay. The static pressure of air at the exit section for isentropic flow through the nozzle is 50 kilopascal. The characteristic gas constant and ratio of specific heats of air are 0 0.287 kg per kilojoule per kg Kelvin and 1.4 respectively. So, this is the figure. So, we need to find out the density of air in kg per meter cube at the nozzle exit and the mass flow rate of air through the nozzle in kg per second. So, let's solve it. See, we know T2 by T1 is P2 by P1 to the power gamma minus 1 by gamma. So, our temperature T2 would be equal to, we know T1 is 400. If we see, we have reservoir, uh, okay. So, temperature in this reservoir is 400. So, T1 is 400. So, we need T2. So, T2 is then 239.73 Kelvin, okay. So, now what we have is that we know that P is equal to rho RT. So, rho 2 is equal to P2 by R into T2. So, from here we get rho 2 is 0.727 kg per meter cube. So, this density of air in kg per meter cube at the nozzle exit is 0.2727 kg per meter cube. So, our next question was to find out the mass flow rate. So, we know CPT1 plus half of E1 square is plus uh, is constant. So, C, 
so from here we know that u1 is 0 as in it was in the reservoir so velocity was initial velocity was 0 so from here we got u2 is equal to 2 cp into t1 minus t2 to the power half now cp can be written as 2 cp can be written as gamma r by gamma minus 1 so it will become 2 gamma r by gamma minus 1 into t1 minus t2 to the power half so from here we get u2 is equal to 567.435 meter per second okay now mass flow rate is what mass flow rate is rho into a into u2 now rho we already have determined a is 0 0.005 it is given and u2 is 567.435 so from here we get mass flow rate is 2.063 which is approximately equal to 2.06 kg per second so with this we conclude the technical part of the gate 2011 mechanical engineering paper we will continue from here we will continue from here uh, and we will give the gate 2012 and subsequent papers and then we will also give you the aptitude of all this 2011 to all the papers that we are presenting Thank, I thank you all of you. See you in the next one.